you started with as a community organizer and so and rose to be president, you understand the power of moving people along, even people who aren't necessarily on your bus when you start. Talk to us a little bit about how you think of movements around the world and the power of those now and what leaders can learn from them. Well, uh, I'd make a couple of observations. Number one is that uh, most big change, most human progress is driven by young people who don't know any better and figure, why can't we do something different? Old people uh, get comfortable or cranky uh, or protective of their status or set in their ways. Uh, there's a reason why if you look at, for example, here in the United States, the civil rights movement, the leaders of those movements were in their 20s. Uh, Dr. King was 26 when he started, 39 when he was killed. Uh, and if you, if you canvass uh, the world, uh, oftentimes that is the, the impetus. Uh, people asking uh, in in ways that uh, I think are familiar to, to many, uh, not uh, why not, but or, or not why, but why not? Uh, why do things have to be the way they are? So, so that's point number one that that young people I think uh, can make an enormous difference. Number two is that because most of us now either live in democracies or countries that purport to be democracies because we, we have won the, uh, the battle of ideas that says governments and our, our common efforts uh, have to be rooted in the legitimacy of people. There is more power than ever in people being able to band together and collectively uh, push for initiatives that are going to make change in their lives. Uh, that's uh, something that for most of human history uh, was unimaginable. That is one of the amazing transitions that has taken place and you will notice that even in autocracies today there is the uh, at least the pretense of democracy because people believe that Governments that are rooted in people are more legitimate, and we that's a battle we won and now have to make real wherever we can. That's point number two. Point number three uh, is simple math. Uh, in most places, if you want to get something done, whether it's a smarter climate change policy or uh, health care for people or more funding for girls' education, you've got to have a majority of people supporting it. You've got to have votes. You have to have the allocation of resources. And that requires mobilization and a game of addition rather than subtraction. So, uh, and, and the fourth point I would make would be the internet now has turbocharged the capacity for us to develop movements in ways that we had not imagined before. Now, the last thing I'll say, so that I don't sound like I'm in the, still in the U.S. Senate and filibustering, <laughs> uh, is, is, I guess, a, a smaller uh, point, but a profound one, uh, that I tried to reinforce with my staff at every level of my public work and, and continue to do to this day. Uh, I actually think organizing, mobilizing, starting movements uh, starts with a story. And you can't create a story that moves large numbers of people unless you are able to listen and hear to the story of the person next to you. Uh, the story of your neighbors, the stories of your coworkers, the stories of your community. Um, the story of people who are not like you. And so uh, one, of, one of the things that I think is, is important is for us to learn how to uh, 
listen to each other and learn how it is that we came to be who we are, think uh, the way we do, um, because that understanding of other people's stories is how you end up ultimately uh, forging bonds and creating the glue that creates movements. Um, you know, uh, every great movement, if you think about Gandhi in, in India, uh, it started with his understanding of India's story and his own story and seeing Indians in South Africa discriminated against and recognizing that there were traditions and myths and a power in those stories that ended up uh, driving out the most powerful empire on earth. Um, it wasn't guns. And increasingly that will be the case, uh, and certainly that will be the case if we're able, if we want to move forward uh, the uh, sustainable development goals that we're talking about is, we've got to be able to tell a story, uh, not only to big donors or politicians, but also to, for example, people here in the United States who may feel like, look, I've got my own problems, why should I be worrying about somebody on the other side of the world? Yeah, I have to say, when we <clears throat> got into philanthropy and uh, particularly studied global health, we were stunned at the progress. We had, we'd had no idea. And it's, it's kind of amazing if you ask even very well-educated people, uh, you know, what's happened with vaccination, what's happened with uh, uh, HIV. They don't know the, the positive story. And a little bit the news is always going to focus on the setbacks because uh, that's what happened that day. The gradual progress doesn't fit that paradigm. And even people who raise money for these causes, I have to say, you know, sometimes even some of the material we create is talking about the piece that remains as though uh, it, it, it's never improved. Do you have any thoughts on how we get this more positive sense of, of progress going and what uh, how we would get that word out? Well, look, uh, you're, you're talking to somebody who, who, for seven years, tried to get the word out that things <laughs> were going pretty good, and, uh, and, and nobody, at least about 40% of the country didn't believe me <laughs> until I was gone, and then suddenly they believed it, and they said, things are great. <laughs> um, so, uh, I, so, so with that caveat, <laughs> uh, I, I, I'd make a couple observations. One, you're right, Bill, there, there is the, the, the nature of the media and maybe just the human brain is to fasten on what's wrong, not on what's right. And I'm not sure we're going to be able to change that, right? Visual displays of a fire. Uh, are much more interesting than just a building sitting there. And so the fire is going to make the news, the building sitting there nicely, and people are walking their dogs in front of it and stuff. That will not make the news. <laughs> um, so so, so I, I don't think that we can count on conventional media necessarily to, to spread the word. Uh, this is, though, where the power of uh, the Internet has not, I think, been harnessed the way it needs to be particularly when we think about young people and, and young audiences. Uh, Malia and Sasha consume information differently than I do. And uh, I think that those of us who've been involved with policy work are still putting out these reports with pie charts and this and that, and <laughs> that's not interesting mm -hmm. to them. Mm -hmm. um, but stories and visual representations of progress can go viral. There's a hunger for it. Uh, it's just that we don't systematically think about it. And, and so uh, I think when the three of us were talking a while back, I mentioned that one of the, one of the areas that I'm deeply interested in is how do we build um, sort of an, uh, a, a digital platform whereby people can go to find out what's happening that is moving the progress on issues and then activates them. Because I heard somebody, I think it was maybe Trevor, saying a, a, an important point. One of, 
I'm very interested in how online communities can move offline. Uh, how this incredible power to, to convene through hashtags and tweets and this and that and the other eventually leads to people meeting each other and talking to each other. And uh, I, I, I think that we have not fully tapped that as a way of spreading the word about progress that has been made. Uh, I also think it is important for us to put some uh, friendly pressure on leaders to tell good stories and to, to make sure that uh, we don't, uh, that, that, that we aren't so rigid in our partisanship or ideologies that we are not willing to acknowledge and share when somebody who might be of a different political persuasion has done something really good, mm -hmm. even if it runs contrary to uh, uh, our short-term political interests. I, I mean, I always used to say, uh, as, as, as big as the differences were between me and my pres uh, predecessor, uh, George W. Bush, that uh, what his administration initiated with PEPFAR was a singularly important achievement that we needed to sustain and build on. And uh, I didn't think that somehow detracted from me to say that somebody from another political party did something really smart and really good and deserved credit for it. Uh, and, and, and I feel as if these days, uh, with, within our political circles, that's a hard thing uh, for people to bring themselves to do. One of the things that Bill and I had the great privilege of doing when you were in the White House late in your presidency was spending a little bit of casual time on a Saturday night. Mm -hmm. And your daughters were in and out of your home, Malia and Sasha. And you've been to our house earlier this yeah. summer and saw Rory and Phoebe, two of our three, in and out of our house. Our daughter Jen is here in the front row. Tell me about... <laughs> Jen's like, thanks, Mom. Yeah, sorry. <laughs> you weren't home that so, night. <laughs> she's... But she's about the age of That's our daughters. job, to embarrass you. Exactly. That's what we do. I just so, did it. Job yeah. none right there. <laughs> but, you know, Jen's about the age of your girls, a little bit older, but how have you and Michelle thought about talking to your children about being leaders in the world and taking up this mantle of what needs to be done in the world? Well, it, it, what, what we've tried to communicate their entire lives is that each of us has responsibilities. Um, when they were small, the responsibilities were small. <laughs> like, say when you want to go potty, and then... <laughs> uh, <laughs> as you get older, your responsibilities grow. Uh, and, and, but, but part of what we, I think, try to communicate is, is that um, being responsible is, is an enormous privilege. That's what marks you as uh, a fully grown human, is that you, that other people rely on you, that you have influence, that you can make your mark, that if you do something well, that that will improve other people's lives. Uh, that uh, the, the kinds of values that we've tried to instill, many of them, your basic homespun values like kindness and consideration and empathy and hard work, uh, that those um, are, are tools by which you can shape the world around you in, in, in a way that feels good. Uh, and so what we've, what we've tried to encourage is that the, the sense that um, it's not somebody else's job, it's your job. And I think that is, that, that's an ethic that they've embraced. Uh, now, they will choose to participate in, di in different ways because they have different temperaments, different strengths. I think one of the mistakes that we sometimes make is to think that there's just one way of making a difference or being involved. Uh, you know, if, if you are a brilliant engineer, uh, you don't have to 
make a speech, you can create an app that allows an amplification or the scaling up of some something that uh, is really powerful. Uh, if, if you are somebody who, who likes to care for people, uh, you, you, you don't have to uh, go out and, and um, lead the protest march. You can mentor some kids uh, or work at a, at a local health clinic. Uh, that is going to make a difference. So, so there are a lot of different ways in which to make a contribution, and we try to emphasize that uh, that to them as well. And then the third thing that we try, try to encourage is uh, what I mentioned in my earlier remarks, which is that uh, you have to be persistent. I, 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 I always tell people that my, my early work as a community organizer in Chicago, uh, taught me an incredible amount, but I didn't set the world on fire. Uh, you know, I, I, I got some public parks uh, for communities that needed them. I started some after-school programs. We, we helped set up a job training program for people who had been laid off of work, but those communities weren't suddenly transformed. They still had huge problems. Um, but I took that experience, and then I was able to build on it. Uh, and I think so often we get impatient because change does not look uh, as if, uh, so sometimes it's not as discernible or immediate or impactful as we had imagined in our, in our minds. And we get disappointed, and we get frustrated. Uh, and for, for me, by the way, that's advice in life and not just in social change. Uh, I, I assume occasionally there was a bug in the software <laughs> bill. That every now and then. Every once in a while, you know, and, uh, oh, we got to patch it again? Ah, this is, this is annoying. Uh, but, but that's how. <laughs> That's how, I heard that's it a little how, differently that's how than that. I wasn't, I wasn't known for my patience. Yeah, yeah. I, I didn't right. hear, oh, darn. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, did you have one last oh, question? Oh, yeah. So this week, uh, uh, part of the reason we're all in New York is the United Nations is meeting. And mm -hmm. you know, so many of these global institutions that were created right after World War II, yeah. uh, World Bank, World Health Organization, UNICEF, They've been key partners uh, for many of these causes. And yet, there is definitely a cynicism about their bureaucracy, their right. efficiency, and their ability to change. In fact, uh, with very few exceptions, like Global Fund and Gavi, we haven't had any new ones. So over the next 10 or 20 years, do you think these global institutions, in terms of reform or creating new ones, it, for pandemics and climate change, can they step up to play the role we need them to play? Well, let, let me first of all say that the biggest problems we confront, no one nation is going to be able to solve on its own. Not even a nation as powerful as the United States of America. Um, th there are times during my presidency where I was attacked for not uh, claiming that we could go on our own, um, as if that was an expression of weakness. No, I, I, I believe that the United States is, in fact, an indispensable nation, uh, and that many of the initiatives and much of the progress that we've made could not have been done unless we underwrote those efforts. Uh, and I'll use as an example of our handling of Ebola, uh, which in retrospect, I think a lot of historians would argue was one of the, if not the most effective emergency public health intervention in history. We, we had to create the architecture and the infrastructure and send our military into create runways where the Chinese could 
then land planes to deliver goods. And we had to provide guarantees to the Europeans so that if they sent health workers, they could feel some assurance that uh, they could be medevaced out if they got uh, uh, infected. So, so, so I take great pride in what the United States can do, but if we're talking about climate change or uh, global migration spurred on by uh, drought or famine uh, or you know, ethnic conflicts, we're not going to be able to solve those things by ourselves. And as you, uh, as you indicated, Bill, some, if, if we get an airborne pandemic, uh, unlike a slow-moving, slow uh, disease that's difficult to transmit like Ebola, uh, if, if we haven't built ahead of time some, some structures to deal with this, uh, millions of people could be uh, adversely uh, impacted. So, uh, so number one, you have to start with the premise and believe that multilateral institutions and efforts are important. And you don't have to cede all your sovereignty or it doesn't make you less patriotic to believe that. You just have to have some sense <laughs> and read. Um, so that's point number one. Point number two is that, uh, in fact, uh, there are problems with existing uh, multilateral institutions, not surprisingly, they were designed post-World War II for the most part, and they couldn't have anticipated everything that's happened. Uh, there is bureaucracy and inertia and resistance to reform. So it is important for every country, every leader, to be honest about the need for reform and not simply think narrowly about, well, I want to keep certain numbers of slots or votes or this or that. At least on many of the issues where there shouldn't be a big ideological controversy. Look, reforming the Security Council, that's something that goes to core geopolitical interests and is a huge, difficult, uh, and perhaps uh, uh, unachievable goal anytime soon. On the other hand, making sure that the WHO works well and that we have uh, a sufficient security trigger when a pandemic or uh, something else happens, uh, that is achievable. And it shouldn't be controversial. It's just a matter of digging in and, and, and getting the work done. Um, when it comes to girls' education, there may be cultural resistance in some places to actually getting it done, but generally speaking, there's not a, there aren't that many folks who will explicitly say, I'm sorry, we don't want to educate our girls and women. As a practical matter, they may, uh, you may see that in, in certain countries, but at the level of our multilateral institutions, there should be a broad consensus. And so what, what I would hope for is that we come up with concrete plans uh, in those areas, uh, oftentimes with respect to uh, the, the sustainable development goals, are areas where there is a consensus on at least the aims, if not always the means, and think about how can we uh, improve delivery systems, how can we improve their operations on a day-to-day -day basis, but ultimately, uh, the last point I would make, that requires leaders to feel as if it matters and is important. That in turn requires the public think that it matters and is important because unfortunately, what you discover is, is that most politicians and elected leaders are followers and not leaders. They, they're called leaders, but most of the time they follow. They, they see what do their constituencies care about, and they respond. And one of the biggest challenges that we've had is that, uh, and, and I speak most intimately about the United States, uh, the general public responds with enormous generosity 
when they see a specific story of a child uh, who's hungry or somebody who's been stricken by uh, you know, a flood. But when it comes to just a general knowledge or interest in development funding, not only do they not know much, but they oftentimes have a negative reaction because their view is we've got a lot of needs here at home. Why are we sending money overseas? Sadly, it is one of the areas, the only areas where Democrats and Republicans agree in, this, in the United States is on foreign aid. And repeatedly you've seen uh, public opinion surveys where people wildly overestimate what we spend on foreign aid. They think 25% of the federal budget is going to foreign aid and helping uh, people other than folks in their towns and their communities. So the need for public education in the ways we talked about that promote, that, that tell a good story, that point out that this is actually a bargain, that connect what we do with respect to development to security, not in, in, in a perfect correlation, but to say that, look, if you've got failed states, then generally some of that's going to spill over on us. Uh, if you have economies that are failing, ironically, if you are concerned about immigration and mass migration, it's really a good investment to make countries work so that people can eat. Because then it's not like they're dying to get on a dinghy and float across an ocean. Uh, if the place, the country where they were born and they loved was functioning. So, so uh, thinking about ways in which we describe this both as an economic imperative, a environmental imperative, a security imperative, um, the more we can influence public opinion, the more you'll see politicians respond. Uh, that doesn't mean that there is not an enormous role to play for NGOs, philanthropy, and so forth. But, I, and I've said this to both Bill and Melinda, um, even with the incredible generosity and enormous skill with which they've deployed uh, their, their resources over the years, the U.S. budget's still bigger. Absolutely. A lot. A lot bigger. And, <laughs> a lot. you know, you, th th this, this notion that you can that I hear sometimes from young people that you can work around government and work around politics because uh, it's too messy or it's corrupt or it's, you know, I, I just don't like those folks or what have you. Uh, I'm sorry, guys, that's not going to work. If you want to get done what you're talking about, you will have to combine effective philanthropy and technical know-how and uh, you know, smart policy engineering with getting your hands dirty, trying to change public opinion and trying to ensure that uh, the people who are in charge of the levers of power uh, are responsive. And, and that will require work, and I guarantee you, you will be disappointed at points. Um, but um, what a glorious thing it is to be responsible for saving the world. That's your responsibility. <laughs> And aren't. Thanks.